himself. There was a ration ticket that you got. So much for bread and so much for meat and so much for groceries. And the total was a little over five shillings. You got that once a week. But you had to travel a certain distance from the last place you got it to to the next place before you'd get it. If you didn't do that, you didn't get it. And when they got you down to the Queensland border, the New South Wales authorities were trying to keep you back, and the Queensland ones were trying to push you over. And once you got over the border, the Queensland mob didn't want you back again. So it was quite a battle. In 1930, there was no federal dole, only state government food relief. If anyone in a household had a job, no one else in the house could claim unemployment relief. And to be eligible for a ration ticket, you had to satisfy the dole inspector that you had spent all your savings, sold any valuables, and been out of work for six months. Many had to turn to charities. Those who are forced to live upon government relief allowances, who pay high rent, who try unsuccessfully to follow the high cost of living, find the mission's evening distribution of food a great boon. The mission realises that hungry men are dangerous men. Since Theodore's resignation, the government had drifted, incapable of decisive action. Joe Lyons, the acting treasurer, supported Niemeyer's call to balance the budget by cutting wages, salaries and pensions. But he failed to persuade Caucus that classical economics held the answer to the crisis. Classical economists were supply-side economics. They looked only at costs of production, getting costs down, with all that that involved as the main way to prosperity, the supply side. That is classical economics. That is economic rationalism as it has come back now. The Great Depression was a boom time for economists. Economics was in the spotlight as never before. We have nothing to fear. From Cambridge, John Maynard Keynes challenged the orthodox fixation with the supply side. It said the main thing in prosperity is effective demand for goods and services that are produced down there on the supply side. And unless you have enough effective demand, they won't function on the supply side, no matter how low they can get their costs. Because the lower they get their costs, the less effective demand there will be. Because costs become income, income becomes spent in effective demand and if you cut your costs down very low you won't you'll be cutting effective demand as well so you can't make business prosperous unless it can sell its stuff The first copy of Keynes's Treatise on Money to reach Australia was flown out for Ted Theodore. From the backbench, Theodore put forward a Keynesian plan for Australia's recovery. He agreed that national income had shrunk dramatically, but pointed to the impact of orthodox cost-cutting, industry paralysed, business confidence shattered and unemployment spiralling. The free market had failed to meet people's needs. It was time for bold government intervention, he said. Attack unemployment first by stimulating the economy through controlled credit expansion. Since Labor had won office, unemployment had risen by 1% every month. Throughout the country, demonstrations broke out against the grudging food relief and in support of paid public works. When Prime Minister Scullin returned in January 1931, he faced a nation demanding action. My father came back from overseas. He had been attending the Imperial Conference with the Prime Minister. And I remember they drove us from uh, the Hotel Windsor to the Richmond Town Hall. And that was when I first heard the sound of breaking glass. 
the glass was in the car. My mother was petrified. She was a, always a very nervous soul. But I do remember the angry faces at the window of the car. My message to the people of Australia today is this. No matter what you may read or what you may hear, I ask you to believe me that the government of Australia will do nothing to ruin Australia or run it over to precipice. I ask, I ask that you will have confidence in your government, that you will have confidence in your nation, and that you will have confidence in yourself. Scullin stunned the parliament by reappointing Theodore as treasurer, even though the Mungana trial had not begun. Joe Lyons resigned in protest. The cornerstone of Theodore's recovery plan was an 18 million pound fiduciary note issue, injecting credit into the economy for public works and assistance to the stricken wheat farmers. The press and the banks condemned the fiduciary note issue as a one-way ticket to inflation and warned that Australia's currency would become valueless. People became hysterical, of course, once it was suggested that notes would be printed to finance the public works. And they thought that if you once started to inflate, if you once started to use bank notes, if you once started to use central bank credit, then everybody would be ruined by the rapid rise in prices that would follow from that. There was real hysteria. As 1931 dawned, it was clear that no Australian government could meet the Bank of England's terms and balance its budget by June. Theodore presented his plan at a crisis meeting with state premiers, including Jack Lang. Theodore argued that inflation could be controlled, and while cuts would have to be made, credit was the key to putting the nation to work. With the Premiers poised to accept the plan, Jack Lang called for an adjournment. When the conference resumed, Lang branded Theodore a banker's man and tabled his own plan, three sentences long. Lang said that if interest repayments to British bondholders were suspended, Australia's standard of living could be maintained. Now, Premier Lang, for us will fight. We've got to see him through. Our motto clear is, Lang is right, and don't we know it too? The Lang plan gripped the imagination of the unemployed and lowly paid workers overnight. The New South Wales and Federal Labor Party split, and Lang formed his own federal party. New South Wales, he said, would go it alone. So give three cheers for Premier Lang and good old New South Wales. The other premiers rejected Lang's plan and commissioned Theodore to negotiate with the banks for credit. In 1931, a million people, one-sixth of the population, had no income at all. Tens of thousands had no money to pay the rent. Evictions were commonplace. The conditions of an, an eviction fight was 30 days from the court order. And they could only evict you from sun up to sunset. On the 30th day, usually was the day they emptied people out because we used to pack the joint on that day with unemployed. Well, of course, there were fashions. The Senate and the banks paid no heed to the clamour in the cities. The Conservative Senate rejected Theodore's fiduciary notes bill and the Commonwealth and private banks refused to provide credit. Sir Robert Gibson delivered an ultimatum to the state and federal governments. 
make the cuts to salaries, wages and pensions, or the Commonwealth Bank would stop the money supply. With the battle of the plans at a stalemate, professional economists entered the field of national policy for the first time. I was asked by the Commonwealth Bank to um, come along as an economist. Uh, <coughs> as their first economist, they didn't have one before that. Leslie Melville joined a team of academic economists commissioned by the state premiers to present a plan to meet the financial crisis at a special premiers conference in June 1931. The governments of the Commonwealth and of the states have been gathered together during the last three weeks to evolve a plan to meet the serious financial position confronting Australia. That plan has now been worked out. We sat in, in considerable doubt as to what would happen when this plan was taken to Theodore. And uh, we were incredibly pleased and perhaps astounded when Sheehan brought back the word that he was going to accept it. Nearly everyone is affected in some way or other in the measures adopted under the Premier's Conference Rehabilitation Plan. Some are affected by suffering a reduction in, in interest or in other income, some by reduction in wages or pensions or salaries, some by increased taxation. Not anybody escapes from the general sacrifice. The Premier's plan cut wages and salaries by 20%. Taxes increased and old age pensions dropped 12.5%. The only concession won by Theodore was a 22.5% cut in interest paid to Australian bondholders. Uh, the holders of the bonds and government securities generally, by making their contribution, will be helping Australia in this hour of trial and will be helping their fellow citizens, many of whom are suffering great hardship and distress. Returns to British bondholders were not cut. Theodore had accepted the poison chalice. As treasurer, he was responsible for the greatest reduction in expenditure in Australia's history. Gibson had said that the Commonwealth Bank would not honour his cheques beyond a certain point. And that, that would have brought him to the position where he wouldn't have had finance to pay public servants. And uh, he had nowhere to go. He, he really had to accept uh, the Premier's plan. The battle of the plans was over and Theodore had lost. The Premier's plan was a victory for orthodox economists and banks and had no trouble passing through the Senate. The cuts reduced the level of activity in the economy even further, causing more bankruptcies and redundancies. Unemployment reached 27%.